Hey, what's going on, party people? Uh, this is Robert Jenkins. I want to welcome you to episode six of the North Star podcast. Today, I'm going to have uh, basically my third guest. So that's a that's a milestone in and of itself, um, I, I guess. Uh, I guess you could say that. I feel like it's a milestone. It's also a milestone because this particular guest is somebody that uh, I care for a great deal, somebody that I met actually in college. And um, this person and I were really close friends and roommates and sweet mates and that kind of thing. We're also uh, pledged the same uh, fraternity, and that's uh, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. So, uh, yeah, we we are Sigma. Sigmas are in the house. I don't want to get don't don't get me started. I start doing calls and stuff, but uh, we'll try to keep this uh, civilized here. But so this this is one of my frat brothers, a person who at the time was a frat brother, but um, since 1994, uh, the person has undergone, I would say, a metamorphosis and a transition, a journey to become, I would say, what they would consider to be their true self. And um, to me, that was, uh, it was, it was, it was okay. It was something that I was, it was unexpected in a way, uh, maybe not so much unexpected, but it was, it was a little bit shocking as you can imagine. But then what made that more palatable, palatable to me was the fact that um, our previous relationship as fraternity brothers had established um, this person's character in my mind. So I knew them to be um, just a good person all the way around. Someone who was down to earth, genuine, compassionate, caring, smart, uh, cool, cooled in a fan, as they say. And um, I, I have to say that it was all of those things that I knew this person to be in our previous encounter with each other as fraternity brothers. That is that kind of eh, it kind of smoothed the the transition in my mind into helping me be able to accept with open arms and an open mind, uh, probably more importantly, uh, this person's new identity. And so uh, in those days, I, I knew him. I knew him as Eric. Today, he is known as or she is known as Erica. And so forgive me as I fumble and bumble over some of these uh, pronouns and stuff like that. But it's still, you know, Erica, it's still uh, something that you, you're trying to get used to. You know what I'm saying? So uh, anyway, welcome to the North Star podcast. And if you don't mind, uh, tell everyone, kind of introduce yourself and uh, talk about who you are, where you're from and your upbringing and then kind of get into uh, ease into that whole uh, black college experience where you and I first met. OK, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. You know, I'm always excited to talk to you, uh, especially because we do have history and I uh, care about you as well. And I've always had a um, great deal of respect for you, and a great deal of admiration and a great deal of love. And it was always um, what I considered um, a very appropriate love, so to speak. You know, nothing um, disrespectful or or um, anything like that, but just a, mm -hmm. a closeness and just an admiration. And I, I think, um, judging by what you stated in your introduction, apparently it was mutual. Um, yes, my name is Erica. I am originally from Louisiana and uh, currently back here. Um, we met, as you stated, in college, and um, college was particularly the um, first year for me was particularly difficult because I was grappling and dealing with a lot of things personally as far as um, identity. And when I say that, it's not that I was searching for who I was, I um, I knew and I came there knowing. It's just that what I tried to do was to suppress it, if that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. And I thought that by just trying to put it out of my mind, that it would go away. And so what happened in turn was I dealt with a um, great deal of depression and a terrible sense of um, loneliness and just feeling as if um, I didn't have anyone to turn to because I was 
there by myself. And if you can imagine uh, what a horrible feeling it must be to be surrounded by people, um, but feeling all alone. And I think because I isolated myself, I probably also missed out on the opportunity to formulate um, relationships with people who may have actually turned out to be pretty cool people. But at the time, there was such a fear of allowing people to get close to me. I just had to try to handle things on my own. And again, as a result, it um, led to isolation and just um, feeling like I was, it was just me against the world. And so the way I dealt with that was not the most productive way because um, I didn't confront it. <clears throat> And um, that backfired on me, and it led to depression. And I don't know if you remember this. Um, I stayed in my room a lot. Like, it was a struggle for me to even get out of bed in the morning and just take a shower, let alone get to class and um, eat dinner and that type of thing. I had to really, really force myself to do that. As a result of all of those feelings, I also had a great deal of social anxiety because I mm. never felt completely safe within large crowds. Um, and, and if you can think back to what it was like for us in college, you know, it's otherwise exciting to be away from home and you meet, mm. you're amongst this new group of young people and you're doing social things like basketball games and, um, activities and things like that. Well, they were more, um, they caused more anxiety for me than they did enjoyment. And so mm. in order to deal with that, I just isolated myself and just, you know, stayed away. So, um, uh, specifically in the first year of college, that's what it was like for me. I even recall, um, not going to class and um, there was the risk of me failing out of school because I just, you know, I was too depressed to go to class. So, mm. you know, through looking back through the uh, through the mist of memory, mm -hmm. I don't really remember that. And I remember that you were always kind of, uh, I would say, uh, not antisocial, but definitely an introvert and definitely to yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I did. I had no idea that you were dealing with any issues like this. And I also had no idea that you, you're, you were in jeopardy of remaining in college at any point. Cause I, you were very intelligent. So I, I just assumed you were yeah. making good grades and, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Well, intelligence and uh, being studious was never an issue for me. I did it all the way through high school. You know, it was, mm -hmm. um, and I felt the same anxiety then. Um, mm -hmm. But you may not have known because I put on a brave face. And, and that's mm -hmm. one thing that you learn to do when you are transgender. And I mean, truly transgender. I don't mean, um, and we'll get into this later, uh, what the media portrays as transgender, as these caricatures of um, women or, you know, what they think women are, or um, in cases of trans men, you know, the hyper-masculine um, thing um, versus just being yourself. It was, um, you know, I, I put on a brave face and I, I did mm -hmm. what I had to do. But, you know, the first semester, like I said, I, I it was that struggle. So I knew the, the importance of me digging myself out of that rut. So I had to force myself to go to class and force myself to um, turn in assignments, but I didn't study, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Fortunately for me, a lot of the coursework and the um, assignments, it, it came easily, mm -hmm. you know? And so I didn't have to, spend a lot of time studying I, and I'm not speaking on that as if I'm proud of it. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. Had mm -hmm. it required a great deal of concentration for me and had it 
required um, me to focus and and really be studious to get it. I mentioned that I was studious before, but studious in the sense that it just it came easy. You know, mm-hmm. I, I didn't yeah. spend a great deal of time studying because that just that wouldn't have worked for me because right. I, I didn't have the the mental the focus. I just didn't. I was depressed. And um so I couldn't focus on that. So fortunately So so in a way you were padded by your native intelligence. You were able to pad pad yourself along through college without falling beneath the waves because you already had that native intelligence and be, it just helped it it worked out well because you didn't have the extra uh, psychic and in, uh, intellectual energy to really devote to college because of the trans situation. None at all. None. And um, had I done so, and I know that sounds crazy coming from a person who majored in biology, but Uh um, had I really been a person who um, needed to spend a lot of time studying, I definitely would have failed. I would have flunked out of school just just flat out. There's no way around it. But I mean, if you, you think about it, being in jeopardy of failing out because I didn't go to class, but then being able to make that up and flip it around and make the president's list just by showing up and doing my assignments and doing the work, that right there gives you just a bit of the idea of, you know, what came naturally yeah. to me and how I was able to just, um, as I stated, just turn it around. Uh, but it, it definitely right. wasn't because I was studious in the sense that I um, was devoting a lot of time to um, studying the way I should have. It was just Mm -hmm. studious in the sense that I could go in, listen to the professors and take what they said and apply it to my assignments and to my my tests and my exams. And so that Mm -hmm. worked well for me. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Um, It occurred to me, listen to you there, I I did remember that you were a biology major. Was Mm -hmm. there any connection between your choice as a uh, a, to major in biology and some of the internal struggles you were having with your own biology? Was that an attempt to understand it better or just something you were interested in, not connected at all? A little bit of both. But the way things work is it's so funny, Robert, how we sometimes don't put the pieces uh, to the puzzles together until later in life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it occurred to me only after I had gone through that experience, because remember I was in a fog for four years. All I Mm -hmm. wanted to do was, um, to get away from there, get out and go have surgery. What I was Mm -hmm. doing was, um, and not even just surgery, but just to get out and just be free of, um, the, the, uh, people that I was seeing every day and the, you know, just go somewhere and get lost and, um, you know, start my life. And so what I was doing those four years is what I thought was expected of me because, Mm -hmm. um, everyone in my family just, you know, well, of course you're going to college, you, you know, you're a straight A student and and that type of thing. Well, even my counselors, I don't want to veer off too far off topic, but even my counselors in high school were like, you know, because I had come up with the idea that I was just going to go to technical college, you know, get a skill and be done. And like I said, go somewhere, get lost and uh, not look back. But it was my counselors who just um, were pounding this into me. Well, well, of course, you're going to college. You're, you're too smart to not go mm. to college. You know, people as smart as you don't um, go to technical school. That's for people who can't do any better. And right. now that I think about it, the smartest people. Uh, sometimes yeah. go to those programs right. because they, know they don't want to uh, spend four years of their lives uh, just right. kind of, you know, fumbling around and just racking up all of those uh, loans and, and that big bill. Yeah. So that's true. But, you know, there's more information out there now. So um, the people who are doing it now are way more knowledgeable than we were. And we didn't know no. about how some of these things that they're doing in two years can lead to very good, very stable, very oh, yeah. lucrative careers, oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. but I was, the yeah, first, a... go ahead. Um, I was uh, one of the first to go to college and graduate. You know, of course, people in my family 
uh, my immediate family had gone. My mother uh, went to Grambling, but her mother got sick. So she came home because she was the oldest. She didn't want to return. She wanted to stay and work and take care of her mom until she Mm -hmm. was better. And she just kept putting it off. So she never went back. My father was military. And so he learned a lot of his skills in the Army. And when he got out, he got his um, culinary arts degree and he got a barber's license. And so that was that. Uh, my older mm-hmm. sister went and decided it wasn't for her, and she didn't um, finish. And I have two brothers who were both military, and they hated, you know, they did school because they had to. And once they got out, they knew that college was not for them. They didn't want to do it, so they both uh, joined the Navy. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was the first, and so it was just expected because I was racking up all of these awards and accolades and in elementary school, literally, and um, all the way through high school, it was just, it was, you know, it it was understood that I was supposed to go to college. And at that time, I couldn't dare say to them, no, that's not what I want to do. I need to go and live my life and um, deal with my reality. And again, the information that's out there now was not there. So Mm -hmm. I didn't um, learn the term transgender until um, I was 12, you know, in junior high school. And I was able to put a name to it. And I was like, oh, so that's what I'm feeling. You know, and I saw it Mm -hmm. on a talk show. But if you look at these kids now, Robert, they're, they have so much information um, because they live in the information age. And it's just, it wasn't available to me then. But um, the biology of the whole thing, I guess inadvertently, unconsciously, was uh, my attempt to learn more and to um, kind of put the pieces together. But It's funny, like I said, that you mentioned it because it was something that I didn't think about until much later after Mm -hmm. the four-year college experience was over because that, again, was just a fog to me. I wasn't thinking consciously about it at that that, um, moment. So yes and no, Um, Mm -hmm. you know. Let me ask you this. Uh, You said something very interesting there, and it's one of the questions that I had kind of formulated beforehand to ask about. Mm -hmm. How... um, approximately how old were you when you first started realizing that you were having these, uh, I would say incongruous feelings. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't want to call them wrong feelings because you, you know, that old thing, how you feel can't be wrong. It's just the way you feel, you know, Right. but how, how old were you? Uh, my first feelings of what we'll call gender incongruence was, um, around the age of five. And let me explain that. Because I'm not at all saying that at age five, I knew, you know, um, Mm -hmm. terminology and things, because that would be a lie. I'm I'm just being honest with you. That's not the case. It's just Mm -hmm. that it was around that time for me where I learned that there was a difference between girls and boys Um, around five, around kindergarten, you know, and um, certain feelings started to arise. So around that time, I was thinking, well, I'm looking around me and I'm seeing girls behave this way and I'm seeing little boys behave this way. And my behavior is more in line with what the little girls are doing. And the way I feel is, you know, the little crushes that I have are not on the little girl. You know, and it's necessary mm-hmm. and it wasn't necessarily sexual because at five, you know, you don't know yeah. about yeah. that type of thing. You, you, uh, a little puppy love or crush for us is totally at, at that age is totally different for us when we're older and we can, um, intelligently, uh, convey, uh, those feelings, um, of, um, you know, uh, sexual feelings and that type of thing. So I knew mm-hmm. 
something around that age. But it was only when I was older at the age of 12 that I learned terminology and that I realized that it was an actual thing and that I wasn't the only person in the world. Now, strangely enough, I was not comfortable with those people that I knew my older brother, cousins, and people like that to call uh, fags and sissies and stuff like that because Mm -hmm. my behavior was not that. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So in other words, as early as age five, you Mm -hmm. you started realizing that something was a little different about you, a little incongruous. Um, And then you didn't, of course, you didn't know the terms gender incongruity or anything like that. But then uh, you noticed that you, it sounds like you're saying you you noticed that you weren't homosexual. Right. Yeah. Because I wasn't comfortable with that. And, um, but when you, when you're going through this, and there's not much information about you. You kind of try to find your way. You know, um, I didn't feel and I didn't identify or relate to gay people, but there were gay men who would uh, seek me out, you know, because to a lot of people, especially in the African-American community, they didn't know anything about transgender. Right. <clears throat> you know? That so was, when was this happening? When were these men seeking you out? What, uh, what age were you? Well, I would say uh, around my teenage... Well, actually, there was a little boy in elementary named uh, Brandon who uh-huh. could obviously tell that it was something different about me than it was about other little boys, not just my size and appearance, but mm-hmm. um, just my natural behavior. Because right. Brandon would walk me home every day. Mm. Brandon started carrying my book. And yeah. one day, Brandon uh, decided when he walked me home, he was going to sneak in a little kiss. Mm. So I was like, oh. You know, I remember yeah. Brandon because that was my first time kissing a boy. Innocent yeah. little, you know, nothing. Right. Right. Grade school kiss. Yeah. Right. And so I was like, oh, okay. And so that kind of reassured me a little bit. I was like, okay, well, what I'm feeling is normal, you know, Mm -hmm. because Brandon's a boy. And Brandon uh, just did to me what I'm told uh, boys do to girls, you know? Mm So um, I would say the first incident was that um as i got older and went uh, to junior high school there were boys who would pick on me uh in front of their friends but when we would get um in a private place where it was just the two of us their behavior would change hmm. and you know they would try to get me to go different places to them i won't ever forget there was one uh boy who would say horrible things in front of his friends or whatever, you know, and he would tease me. But then he also was the same one who tried to get me to come behind the building to Mm. uh, be with him. And, you know, it got to the point where there were boys in junior high school who were exposing themselves to me, um, that type of thing. I remember also in high school, uh, there were boys who would tease me publicly but privately, they would test me to see how far they could go with certain mm-hmm. things to see if it would lead mm-hmm. to a sexual manner. But what you don't know is that also led up um, to college. There were guys in college who tried to do that to me. But I had made it up in my mind that I would not give them the satisfaction. And so I just, I never took the bait, basically. Right. Right. So I remember that that brings up the point that uh, another kind of a thing that I noticed about you in college, mm-hmm. as cool as you were. And uh, I always thought you were genteel is what I, the way I would describe you. Yeah. Um, very cultured, quiet, slender, mm-hmm. uh, small statured, mm-hmm. well-dressed, intelligent person. Mm-hmm. So I thought of it as genteel. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not necessarily effeminate. Yeah. It didn't seem it didn't quite feel effeminate. 
It was it was a little different. So one of the things I noticed about you though is that you uh, in, in college, you know, there's t- typically people out sowing their wild oats. So yeah. you see a, a lot of sexual behavior on college campuses. Yeah. The, the thing that marked you that stood out about you is that I think I mentioned this to you before. You were actually what I would call asexual, meaning mm-hmm. you did not seem to be interested in pursuing any kind of sexual relationship or intimate relationship, physically intimate, mm-hmm. with anyone that I could see, uh, male or female. Yeah. And um, you explained that to me several years ago. Why that? Uh, why that was so? Can you can you touch on that a little bit? Well, um, the reason it was so, and what you depicted as asexual, I was a very sexual person. I believe we're all. Um, sexual by nature, but what came across you as asexual, the reason I didn't do that is because I knew, you know, what I was feeling and who I was definitely by that time, because keep in mind by then I was able to put a name to what I was um, experiencing and what I was living. So I definitely knew what it was, but the reason that I didn't put on those airs or anything is because um, I couldn't have sex the way I wanted to have it. So I definitely was not going to be involved in a homosexual relationship because I didn't identify as that. And I didn't have any desire to have what I would consider homosexual sexual activity. And Mm -hmm. on the flip side, I wasn't going to embark on a relationship with a woman because I felt like that would have been unfair to both of us. Um, Mm -hmm. It's something that would not have been natural for me. And I think it would have been unfair to sort of pull um, a woman into what could very well be described as chaotic for her. And um, some people see as confusion. And I can see how they would see that. I wasn't confused. I was very clear on who right. I was. But right. I was so sure about <clears throat> who I was that I didn't feel the need to pretend um, just to make other people comfortable or to stop other people from talking. So that's why mm. you never saw me in a quote unquote um, love relationship with a woman in college and definitely not a um, homosexual relationship in college because I didn't feel um, comfortable with either of the two. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what that was about. I see. So, so from what you've been saying, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you is that, uh, did you, do you think that any of this out of place feeling could have been misinterpreted homosexuality, but you, you seem like you're definitely saying no to that. Do I think like for me that it could have been, Oh, absolutely not. No, <laughs> absolutely mm. not. Because I, I had so much access to that, Robert. I could have had, um, and, and one of your other fraternity brothers, you probably know who he is, but I won't mention mm-hmm. his name. Mm-hmm. He told me, he was like, you can have any of these boys um, at this um, college that you want, because there are some who are curious and interested in you, and you're such a dummy. Mm. You can have any of them. But what he didn't understand is I didn't want them, not like that. Mm -hmm. You you know what I mean? And at the time, I definitely didn't feel like putting forth the effort to explain to them what I was going through. Because I don't think, and please don't take this the wrong way. I don't want to sound snobbish when I say this. But I don't think at that time that intellectually, an 18, 19-year-old college boy who was just looking to screw whatever he Mm -hmm. could, could really... One, understand, and two, appreciate the nuances of what transgender was. I didn't have, you know, I just, I was like, why even bother um, Mm -hmm. explaining that to them when it's just easier for me to just be abstinent and just not even, or at that time, celibate? Mm -hmm. Um, Because I didn't, you know, have a sexual encounter until I was. Oh, I would say 20, 21 years old. Mm, wow. Well, that's actually uh, commendable mm-hmm. that you would choose. Um, that's a, that's the noble route to take, though. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Let me let me do a quick uh, technical check here. 
okay. and see, uh, make sure everything is okay. What were you saying? I just said okay. <laughs> My pen? Oh, okay. All right. Okay, yeah, so um, everything is good. Um, so what I was going to kind of get into the question next is uh, this is kind of a sensitive question. And being a gentleman, I hate to even go there, but also... Um, the, the whole thing is about education and understanding. So just mm -hmm. satisfying my own personal curiosity about it. Um, was there any, uh, in your past, was there any physical, sexual, mental abuse or trauma that might have caused you to feel the way you feel uh, um, in regard to being trans? There um, were, there was an incident, but it didn't cause me to feel the way that I felt. I already felt the way that I did. Um, I was in college, actually. I never told you about this. And um, this was long before you and I were roommates. Um, but again, being that I was already in college, I had already, uh, I knew who I was and what the situation was. You and I talked before about how sometimes, well, and actually I just mentioned how I feel like guys, saw something different in me. Like I told mm -hmm. you about Brandon in elementary school. But when mm -hmm. I went to college, uh, there was an incident where I awoke to someone on top of me. I was asleep and it was a sexual assault in progress, but I was able to fight that off. And uh, in addition, there were two people who came. I'm so surprised you didn't hear about it because, you know, as small as the campus was, but mm -hmm. um, uh, there were two people who happened to be the sweet maids who heard the commotion and came to my assistance. And so um, what I did was I was able to escape the full on sexual assault. And mm -hmm. um, but I had to speak with the dorm director about it. And I mm -hmm. actually encouraged him to not call the police because I didn't want that attention right. on me. But I did have to mm. write a statement and give it to him, which he in turn gave to the, the dean. And mm. uh, they had a hearing and everything. And this gentleman was uh, kicked out of school. Wow. And I got yeah, I didn't, I... a new room and a private room. And from then on, I had a private room until you and I actually became roommates. Huh. Dang, I'm trying to, like I said, I'm trying to peek, peek back through the mist of memory, man. I just, uh, I, I can definitely say I did not hear anything about that at all. Yeah. Um, and I, I, looking back on it, I, I appreciate those guys who um, assisted me. I appreciate their tact in not running around telling everybody. You know what I mean? Hmm. So That surprises me on so many levels, man. Uh, that the dorm managers and directors, because some of those guys was characters, and I would not have uh, suspected that they would have the integrity and the maturity to handle that situation like that. Yeah. And I definitely wouldn't have uh, expected any of our age uh, cohort <laughs> guys that we went to school with to handle that with any kind of maturity or integrity. Well, that, let me that tell you what it was. Did. Uh, let me tell you what it was. I don't, it may not have been so much about me as it was about the fact that they were athletes. And uh, maybe they didn't want that tainted. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The the image of that, they didn't want that out there. But it was very, very hush hush. And um, now as a matter of fact, I can't remember if he was um, expelled from school, but I know that he was kicked off out of the dorm. He was prohibited from living in the dorm. But oh. um, I think, um, you know, he just maybe just, I don't know, just went away, but, um, I don't, it may not have even been, like I said, an expulsion, but he definitely was banned from living on campus. So hmm. like I said, um, you know, I want to see good in people and, you know, uh, <clears throat> ideally you would hope that it's good character, but I think it was more so about association and that type hmm. of thing and, you know, how yeah. it would have looked. And um, so, yeah. so that goes back to then uh, your concerns about not feeling safe on campus. And it turns out that these are actually um, all too real. Yeah, they were uh, definitely all too. 
yeah, definitely not unfounded um, Mm -hmm. reasons for feeling the way that I've felt and always feeling like I had to watch my back and also Mm -hmm. feeling, uh, which made me even more rebellious or reluctant, I should say, to um, accepting the advances of uh, people who were trying to come on to me on the sly or on the slick, you should, you would say, um, mm-hmm. I just, I didn't want to give them the satisfaction. Um, mm. So I just, you know, I, I played dumb a lot of times uh, as a result of um, mm-hmm. the way I felt about it. And I just, I didn't allow myself to, and I'm not going to lie to you. I was very attracted to some of the people who, um, tried to test me and see where it could lead. Because think about it, Rob. I, and I don't even think this was cases of their being um, homosexual or anything like that. I just chalk it up to a bunch of horny young guys <laughs> who mm-hmm. probably would have gotten it from anywhere they could and never even spoke mm-hmm. of it again. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I think um, if they could have gotten it from me or, or whatever, I don't think it would have changed the way they felt about their girlfriends or what I think it would have been just a case of some of them being curious and uh some of them just being horny I really do mm. you know mm-hmm. so because do you think um how widespread do you think that whole violence issue is in the in, in the trans community violence yeah oh it's very, that kind of assault and stuff like that oh it's very widespread unfortunately um Disproportionately, black trans women are killed, um, you know, at a higher rate than anyone else in the LGBT community. And Mm -hmm. typically, black trans women, the acts of violence and the murders committed against trans women are typically done by men with whom these women have had sexual encounters or full-on relationships. And Mm -hmm. lots of times it happens when people find out that these particular men have been with these women or there's the fear of people finding out. And it's Mm -hmm. just one of those things. People don't address it, you know, number one, because uh, transgender is such a small uh, percentage of the population, Um, you know, very, very minuscule percentage of Mm -hmm. the population. And number two, um, in the black community, there's just not a lot of sympathy um, in terms of treating us like we're human. Um, Unfortunately, some people don't put race before gender or gender identity, and somehow we're less black, you know, or Mm. we don't fit into who they feel. Let's just say we don't fit into the Black Lives Matter um, um, group as far as, ironically, the Black Lives Matter Mm -hmm. group was founded by two uh, black lesbians. And they try to be all conclusive, but, you know, with the involvement of the Black Lives Matter, with the, the, uh, a lot of the men who are really, really, I don't even say they're pro-black, I say they're pro-black heterosexual male Mm -hmm. because at any given point when there's a black man killed by the police, you know, all of us are expected to pick up arms and march and black lives matter, black lives matter. But when you hear about the black trans women who are killed just for being themselves or because the black man that they're dealing with can't really um, deal with his attraction to a black woman, then those same men get quiet. You don't hear a word. You don't hear a peep out of them because, Mm. I mean, do black lives matter or do just black men's lives matter? Yeah. Mm. I always, uh, I I think uh, like I was mentioning to you earlier, I have a, I have huge issues and qualms with the, with black lives matter Mm -hmm. in general as a group. Um, Mm -hmm. First of all, I question their, their founding and are they, like I said, an AstroTurf group, one of those fake grassroots Mm -hmm. grassroots groups. Mm -hmm. Um, And like I was telling you, I looked at their website um, 
getting ready for a show that I'm going to do in the future, just doing some research and thinking about it and stuff. And first of all, it's a terrible website. The colors are terrible. It doesn't load fast. It's like, who who designed this? And in, in 2019, how do you have a website like that? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I need but the to second thing, out, I've never checked it out. Yeah. The second thing that I noticed was, um, I, I would say for what they purport to stand for, if you look at all their founding principles and guiding principles and stuff like that, I w- it seemed like 40, 50, 60 percent of them had to do with creating safe spaces for um, LGBT individuals. And mm-hmm. I was like, uh, that seems to be like splitting the mission off right there. You know what I'm saying? It, if it it's does. black folks, it's black folks. It's all black folks. Why, why do they keep talking about and making such a big deal about LGBT? Um, mm-hmm. So anyway, like I said, I, I just don't know what to think about that group personally. Um, because? Because the group was initially started by, to my understanding, two lesbian individuals. Mm. Mm. And what I was telling you was, I feel like where we go wrong uh, as Black people is we put everything before race. Um, that's both LGBT and non-LGBT people. I feel like... Um, the whole safe space thing is needed, but I mm-hmm. think that if we don't learn how to come together, putting race first, we'll always get left behind. And it's mm. the same with the people who call themselves woke and pro-black and stuff like that. If you don't realize that I'm just as black as you, despite gender expression or gender identity, then we won't ever be able to come together. I mean. I'm black first. Mm. What makes yeah. being transgender, what makes me any less black or any deserving of uh, black support than you? I don't, mm-hmm. that's one thing I can't reconcile or, or wrap my head around. I don't, I don't understand yeah. why my being black and being positive and being uh, an addition to the black community and an asset, why is that not good enough? Right. I think it may have something to do uh, perhaps with the fact that in a general sense, the black community is very conservative and we don't realize that ourselves. We vote liberal and we think we're liberals, Mm -hmm. but with our church background and the things Mm -hmm. that we have been through as a people and and our outlook as a people, I have always believed that we're actually conservative. And I think that it's that church background in particular that's that might have some influence. That's, Say again. That's, that's a lot of it. And that's a very good observation. And that's one of those unspoken things that we don't talk about. And I think that a lot of us um, try so hard to be accepted that we don't admit how conservative we really are. Um, but I think that's just a part of it. I think the other part of it is media presentation and media mm-hmm. representation. Um, I was talking to you earlier about how the media, I think, has been just as bad for black, uh, for black trans women as it has been good. And um, I think the images of black trans women that are portrayed in the media give people in the black community such a, a sense of... Um, discomfort uh, because black trans women seem to be uh, presented as these caricatures of black women or what they think womanhood is. And I'm not saying that they're not doing that to themselves. I'm saying that media is very powerful, Mm -hmm. whatever the medium, whether it's TV, whether it's internet, social media, Radio is very powerful. And when you only see images of what people think are over-exaggerated images or forms or uh, things that people may depict as men in dresses and men in wigs and that type of thing, I think Mm. it's more detrimental because we're not shown as just human beings who earn college degrees and who go to work every day and who have mortgages and who go to the grocery store. You know, mm-hmm. if, if we're always shown uh, 
you know, with um, all of this, this, these painted faces and these um, over-exaggerated bodies and uh, we're sexualized all the time. And um, it, it's detrimental, Robert, you yeah. know? Yeah, it is very. I think it is too. Not to mention, to be honest, mm -hmm. go ahead. Well, I was going to no, say go ahead. not to mention the fact that there are so many people now who are are, are blurring the lines, and unfortunately, mm. the lines are being blurred before people are really educated on what transgender is, or before they're fully aware of um, what it means. Um, before we can distinguish that then you have all of these other terms and all of these other things that come along like um gender non-conforming and gender fluid and that type of thing and mm -hmm. it's confusing people right. and i can see how people outside of the community would be confused because we haven't yet had enough conversations on what transgender is so unfortunately Anytime you see someone make a video or have a criticism of maybe a gay man who's wearing makeup and decides he wants to sometimes dress in women's clothes or, you know, uh, do this type of thing, they loosely use that term transgender. And that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not the case. That's not what he is. And they, right. they do that. Uh, when I say they, I mean the people who make these criticisms and make these videos, these YouTubers, they do that. And the person that they may be condemning or whatever doesn't even identify as trans. But because you see right. him in makeup and a wig or women's clothes or high heels or with a purse, you automatically assume he identifies as transgender. And then we're all lumped into the same category. And then it becomes more and more difficult for us as transgender women and men to be seen a certain way or to have the opportunity to define to you who we really are versus right. who you think we are. Right. So that's interesting. Uh, you mentioned earlier <clears throat> before when we were talking that um, you think that sometimes a lot of trans people play a role in their own discrimination. And that's kind of what you touched on right there. And I'll say mm -hmm. that, um, and it's it, it, to be, to be totally honest, this is, this is how I feel about the situation in general. Mm -hmm. I, as a lib, I'm a libertarian and, um, I consider myself to be an open-minded person. Okay. So I really don't care mm -hmm. what a person's anything is. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Race, gender, whatever they, whatever they choose and claiming that, ultimately has no real importance to me because mm -hmm. the kind of person I am, I've noticed, I just like cool people. Yes. I like people that treat me right and that are cool to be around and that have something that distinguishes them from the 7 billion other people on the planet. You know what I'm saying? That's true. And I'm, that's a, I'm a dope ass individual. So I get, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, <laughs> but, I, I would tend to agree. Yeah, but but I was gonna say uh -huh. that's what I think uh, uh, is probably uh, to the extent that some people aren't comfortable with LGBT individuals. Mm -hmm. I think personally, yeah. it could stem from the fact that they're not portraying themselves as interesting individuals. They're yeah. portraying themselves as LGBT individuals, and that's the thing. And um, that's one thing I've tried to again popular unpopular opinion of mine, and this is why you know not all transgender people may um be comfortable with me or uh, the mm -hmm. things that i say i feel like if you focus on that too much it tends to be a turnoff to people i would much rather you um listen to my music first or read my writing first or something like that and get to know me as a person and then we can talk about you know the transgender thing later but mm -hmm. um, I, in a perfect world, I would only have to discuss that with uh, my intimate partners or my yeah, doctor. I was just about to say, you know, I was just about to in, say, in I a, wouldn't, in a I wouldn't want to know about that right. mostly at all. You in, know what I'm saying? In, in a perfect world, uh, yeah. you know, um, uh -huh. but unfortunately we live in the 
what I call the um, anti-social media age where right. Um, right. too many people feel like they should have all access to everything that you do um, mm-hmm. instead of what it is that you're trying to focus on, like your art form or whatever. And so mm-hmm. I think that is, um, is detrimental. And also when I wrote the article that I did, uh, we were discussing earlier about how um, trans women, particularly black trans women, and I say that because that's who I am. And so that's the community that I'm addressing. Right. The way I feel that they play a part in their own discrimination is with all of these gotcha moments and the... Mm exposing people. I think most recently, the most recent I can think of is the whole uh, incident where there's this rapper, this, um, I can't remember his name, uh, something Buck, uh, Young Buck. He was Mm -hmm. um, a rapper with 50 Cent or something Mm -hmm. like that. I feel like um, that incident where the young lady recorded him and uh, the transgender uh, lady that he was dealing with She recorded him and decided to share that with the media. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it just so happens at the same time she had an album (laughs) coming out of her or or a single or whatever. But here's my thing. In order for you to have one of those gotcha moments and have this big exposure or exposing of the man that's dealing with you in my mind that means you think there's something wrong with being with you otherwise there's Mm -hmm. no exposure you understand what i'm saying whereas Mm -hmm. with me i won't be discussing anybody that i'm romantically involved with unless he and i have already had that conversation and he's okay with putting it out there but you're not going to hear it from me You know, I may mention something like, oh, well, you know, in my relationship, this happens, this, that. But as far as names, photos, like why? I don't understand why any woman, transgender or otherwise, would take to social media to tell the intimate details of her um, sexual escapades. I don't I don't get when that became a thing. You know exactly, and, and and I would say not that that isn't just confined to any woman or to any trans woman or anything like that. That's confined to human beings. Why would you put information like that out on social media? That's private stuff. It's called intimate. That's what it, it means. That's you know what, what intimacy is like. Unless you're um, into erotica and that's your art form or anything, then I don't even think that that should be put out there like that. I, I, I don't get exactly. it. I don't, I don't get why, especially women. I don't know why that's popular. I don't know why people think that's attractive. I don't know when I don't want to veer off too far, but I don't know when being a side chick became a mm-hmm. badge of honor. None of that. <laughs> I, I don't right. know when it became okay to say you're sleeping with somebody's husband. I don't get it. Yeah. But as far as trans not, women yeah. goes, that whole exposing thing, you know, I, I mean, think about that <clears throat> psychology for just a second. We talked about what society thinks about how society frowns upon it. But what about you as an individual? There's no gotcha moments with me because I'm going to be honest with you, Robert. I think it's a privilege to be with me. So there are no gotcha <laughs> moments. Word. <laughs> gotcha. You know what I'm saying? So if you don't yeah. think that of yourself, then I feel like you are playing a role in your own discrimination because what happens is the more you put that out there like that, the more people are going to continue to think that something's wrong with it. And they're not going to see you as a person. They're going to see you as this thing that uh, people shouldn't have contact with. And then there'll always be that whole public shaming of the men who date transgender women. And that's unfortunate. Because mm-hmm. I, I feel like different men like different shit, mm-hmm. you know? So mm-hmm. I, I feel like we never should have known anything about it. Right. Uh, you shouldn't. You know. You shouldn't. It shouldn't have anything to do with anything. Just as a decent um, human being, why even tape exactly. a conversation that you have a man that, or tape a conversation exactly. that you have with a man with whom you've been intimate? 
just to put it but out that's there. Because, that's because he was a star and that person wanted some of his fame and she knew. And that's unfortunate. That, that, mm-hmm. That's unfortunate. Yeah. You know what? I want to circle back to some, <clears throat> something. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, uh, you were saying that when you were in college, mm-hmm. you were really, it was a really tough time for you, really depressed probably the whole time and yes. dealing with, with your own personal issues. Mm-hmm. And that also kind of, leads me to another question about, mm-hmm. you know, we hear that in the trans community, um, there's a high suicide rate. Yes. And that suicide rate is, it's very high, something like 40% mm-hmm. pre-surgery and pre-hormones. Mm-hmm. And it still remains at like 40% post-surgery mm-hmm. and hormones. So mm-hmm. in other words, these, these uh, unfortunate individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, who are dealing with the issues that they are dealing with and facing, they seem to not be able to find a fix or a cure for it with or without the surgery or the hormones because Mm -hmm. the the suicide rate remains constant. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that suicide rate is due to that high suicide rate? Is that due to society's ill view of trans people and LGBT in general? And that's playing such an ugly role on, on their lives that it's forcing them into suicide. Or do you think it's, Really, it's an internal thing that they are dissatisfied and incapable of dealing with and facing that's causing the suicide, or is it some combination of both? It's definitely a combination of both. Now, let's take the um, society view, first of all. Let's tackle that. You're dealing with individuals who are told on a daily basis that we are wrong just for feeling the way that we feel or just for wanting to live um in what we may consider our truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Couple that with a lot of us, particularly in the black community who grew up in the church, um, which compounds um, that whole notion that you're supposed to be this way, not that way. Mm -hmm. Now I will say personally for me, Um, It was a little different in the church because I'm Methodist. I grew up Methodist. And uh, in the Methodist church, now you'll remember the college that we attended was a um, United Methodist. um, Yeah, it sure was. Yeah. So um, I was comfortable in that sense uh, because with Methodist um, people, there's not typically this um, hell, fire, and brimstone, you know, damnation type sermons mm-hmm. on Sunday. So mm-hmm. I never grew up with that. Um, typically what it is in the Methodist church is we don't care who you are. Our goal is to try to get you to have some type of relationship with a higher power and to know that there is something bigger than you. And also, to um, we're big on social activism, that type of thing, social service and um, giving back to uh, those in need in the community. So um, mm. social service and definitely um, a relationship with the higher power. But you will also see in the Methodist church, women, um, LGBT people who are in very prominent roles as bishops, uh, pastors, leaders, that type of thing. So for me, I was fortunate in that sense where I wasn't hit over the head with that every Sunday as a child Mm -hmm. when I went to church, because I'm going to be honest with you, that would have definitely compounded the way that I was already feeling. But Mm -hmm. for a lot of people who grow up in the church, particularly in the Southern church or the Southern Baptist church, black people, They, they deal with that because that's the one thing that they hear all the time. You know, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. God doesn't make yeah. mistakes. Uh, if you were born this way, you know, there's something wrong with you feeling another way. So society, the black church, that does play a role in it. Another thing, uh, as you mentioned, um, this desire to find oneself and some people unfortunately don't do that now again mine is a very unpopular opinion my opinion is there are some people who are saying that they are transgender but they are not and there are Mm -hmm. some people who are having surgical procedures done 
permanent ones, and they should not. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Because yes, I do. Th- Indeed, this is a reason why the psychological evaluation is such <clears throat> an important part of the transition and the mm-hmm. process. If you are not emotionally, psychologically sound Mm -hmm. before you undergo the hormone therapy and God forbid the surgery, that's not going to be a fix for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can take that a step further and say that if you are a person engaging in homosexual sexual activity and you are comfortable with your sex organs in homosexual sexual activity, surgery is not for you Hmm. because you're not going to be satisfied. Those Hmm. are two different sensations. Do you understand what I mean? You're not going to go from being comfortable and getting pleasure from that type of sexual activity to being satisfied with the sensation that you're going to get because, you know, but for people like me who have nothing else to compare it to, it's a little different. Mm. You understand? Because I've always Mm. known that I was not interested in any type of uh, homosexual behavior or um, intimate activity. But there are people who think that just because they're going through this process that they're supposed to take that next, take that next step. And that's Mm -hmm. not the case. And those people will forever be unhappy. Those people will probably forever be depressed. And a lot of them do commit suicide. And, Mm -hmm. but I want to caution people who are outside of the community and they use that as a reason to say that this is why um, it's a bad thing or why transgender should not be a thing. I want to caution people um, who think that way and let them know that if a person who commits suicide after, or if a person who has had this procedure done or they go through this procedure and they're still depressed and they commit suicide, then that's more than likely the sign of a person. Or also I'll say people who decide that they want to revert after they've mm-hmm. gone through the process, then that's the sign of a person who should not have gone through the process. Mm-hmm. I think, and that would go back to what we were talking about, the lines being blurred. I think there uh-huh. are some people who think because they're effeminate and some people who think because they are entertainers like uh, female impersonators and they want to take it mm-hmm. a step further and look more feminine and they start doing these things. That's not the reason to take hormones or to Mm -hmm. um, have surgeries or that type of thing. That's not the reason. Transgender is a real thing, but it's a very rare thing. And there are a lot of people undergoing these processes who are not what you would call a true transgender person, and they will never be Mm -hmm. satisfied. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a, there's two things that make me, uh, things I want to follow up with here. Do you think um, since you knew at the age of around five that Mm -hmm. that something was um, incongruous about the way you were feeling, Mm -hmm. do you feel that, um, because from what I understand, they're giving like serious hardcore hormones um, and putting people on the path to surgery when these are, we're we're actually talking about kids here as early as, as early as age four and five, Mm -hmm. they're, they're starting to give them things, hormones that actually block puberty. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, these advocates, these, I guess you call them trans advocates or something like that, that are, that are doing this and encouraging parents to do this to their kid, their children are saying, well, you know, it's reversible. If if they don't like it, they can go back. And and I'm thinking also, I don't think that's reversible, man. I don't, Mm -hmm. I also don't think there's enough um, uh, research and study on the issue, but it seems to me, and and I'm not making light of the situation, but like my aunt up here in Maryland tells me that when I was five, I literally used to, I for the first time uh, came to stay with her for the summer, and, and I, I first met a dog. So she had a pet dog, and I was so in love with the dog that I 
started acting like a dog mm-hmm. and started demanding that, that I would that she would feed put my dinner on a on a plate on the ground next to the dog's plate and I would get down on all fours and eat and play, you know, and be down there with the dog. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, if if a five year old and I consider myself to be a relatively sane, intelligent person, so mm-hmm. somewhat, if I'm doing that at five, that just seems like all the more um, indication that we should be cautious mm-hmm. in uh, allowing children to do something that is, in fact, as far as I can tell, irreversible yeah. or are not fully reversible and potentially damaging. I mean, what's your thoughts on the, on like the age limit and the whole Mm -hmm. kids and transgender type thing? Mm -hmm. Well, well, let me just say uh, first uh, with the comparison, I don't necessarily like the comparison between uh, you wanting to be a dog. And I'm not saying this about you because I know your intentions are are good because we know each other, but I Mm -hmm. see some people uh, making light of what transgender is by saying things, making jokes. Well, let's say I want to be a giraffe. Yeah, I, yeah. I decide I want to be, you know, I don't, I don't want people to make too light of that. I understand what you're right. saying. Right. Um, and let me clarify for anybody that might, uh, for my four listeners that I have, mm-hmm. when I say that I'm definitely not intended to, to, to make light of the situation. But what I'm saying is yeah. kids are creatures of imagination Absolutely. and little life experience. Absolutely. And I, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's where I'm going with that. Absolutely. So it's like, mm-hmm. Bearing that in mind, yeah. that their kids don't have any life experience, they have no wisdom, they have no understanding mm-hmm. about anything, and they are, they still close enough to, to the other world that they came from to be imagination, creatures of imagination. Mm-hmm. Isn't it, doesn't it seem like folly to be encouraging them to do anything at all along these lines? Well, well let me just say this. I would not allow my child to do it. And I'm Uh saying this as a transgender woman who was of age, um, who knew um, matter of factly what I wanted and how I was feeling. And I took it upon myself um, as an adult to Mm -hmm. um, move forward with it. Now, I will also say that children today, people today have a lot more information at their fingertips Mm -hmm. than I had. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when I was a kid, the, the Internet was not a thing. And so mm-hmm. I was not able to just pull up information on what I was feeling and at the press of a button. So I think that uh, it's safe to say that I would not allow my five year old child to dictate to me that um, that the um, this is what, you know, how mm-hmm. we would proceed. Not to say that the feelings aren't real. Because I don't right. want anyone to minimize what I was feeling at the time. So uh-huh. I, um, I definitely don't want to uh, minimalize or minimize the feeling. But right. as a parent, I would not start my child on a hormone regimen at, at that age because mm-hmm. um, the hormones are very powerful. Mm-hmm. And um, as far as the argument that it's reversible, well, after you've been taking them for so long, there are things that are irreversible as far mm-hmm. as the way your body develops and that type of thing. What mm-hmm. I would encourage parents to do is to hear their children um, talk through those things with them. Mm-hmm. But I would be very, very hesitant to start my child on any type of medication that would block hormones or anything. I understand the reasoning behind it, Robert, because puberty is an emotional time for a child. And if you compound that with a child who is feeling some type of gender incongruence or uh, dysmorphia, and is not comfortable with themselves based on the legitimate feeling that they are transgender or whatever. I understand Mm -hmm. why that would be the route that parents would want to take, but I feel like a lot of that, it's fear-based. And I feel like um, a lot of that Fear of what? A fear of parents not knowing uh, what will happen if they don't allow their children to do this. Fear of parents Mm. possibly losing their children to suicide. Um, Fear of parents pushing their children away from them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, mm-hmm. and those are all very legitimate uh, feelings. Right. Do but, you think fear of uh, being considered a bigot or something like that? Absolute, transphobic? was? Yeah. Ill? Yeah, absolutely. Fear of because I'm going to tell you, I went through that period with my mother because I felt like she and I had spoken about. Can you hold on just a second, Robert? Yeah. Uh huh. I'm sorry about that. Uh, fear. Right. You, you know, I went through that period with my mother. I felt like because I had had that conversation with her, um, that she didn't do enough. And it was mm-hmm. years later when I realized that she did the best that she could with mm-hmm. um, with everything that she had to work with. Yeah. You understand? So in other words, like, what what do you do? What do you do as a parent? When who, who would know? This is foreign to you. Well, she didn't know. There was no group. Yeah. There was no support right. group um, at that time. And then, of course, being African American, we didn't know anything mm-hmm. about that. You know, you, you, mm-hmm. where do mm-hmm. you go? You know, therapy in itself is frowned upon in the African American community. Yeah. Try to yeah. tr- uh, let's talk about therapy because your child um, is feeling gender incongruent or is saying she's transgender. Where do you go? Yeah. You know, I tried it on my own I when it was young uh, by confiding in a doctor, and he sent me to some. Southern Baptist white man who was saying, um, well, you know, you're not going to be able to get a job, right? Okay. And so like that's, that's, that has nothing to do with the concerns you right, had. Right, nothing to do. So he never addressed that. What he addressed was his own personal bias against transgender people. So that made me um, clam up even more and become mm. even more introverted. And I felt betrayed, mm. actually, by mm. the black doctor who sent me who I found out mm. also was a preacher. And when I confronted mm. him on it, he apologized. And he, according to him, that wasn't his intention, but I, I couldn't help but feel like, you know, it, it's no coincidence that you feel a certain way about me transitioning. And then you send me to someone who mm. echoes your opinion. So I think um, for us, there was no information, but these days, because parents have the information, there is a fear, I think, that um, if they don't move a certain way, that their behavior is going to be frowned upon. And then, and, mm-hmm. and in their defense, let's think about it. No parent wants their child to suffer. Right. You know, you have children. You, you, mm-hmm. That hurts you when your children hurt. I can only yeah. imagine. You know, I'm, I it does. love my nieces and nephews dearly, and I can't see, stand to see them hurt. I can only imagine what it's like for a parent. So Mm -hmm. I think that there is a lot of fear. There is a lot of which way do I go type Mm -hmm. thing, you know? Yeah. And, um, but to answer your question, I, I, I would hesitate to allow my child to start that young. I would wait. This is just me again, unpopular opinion. Um, I would wait until my child was at least 18 then he or she could um, make that decision on whether or not they want to move forward with therapy and hormone treatment. But I know why, if you're asking me this, let me just say, I know why a lot of parents are not waiting that long because they don't want their child to go through the pain of having their body develop in a way that those children feel would be foreign to them. Mm. Or wrong for them. Do you understand yeah. what I mean? Right. Think back yeah, to puberty when you went through puberty mm-hmm. and what a, mm-hmm. you know, it, it was a strange feeling. So to mm-hmm. have a transgender child go through that, knowing this is not the way their mind is working, that's a horrible feeling for them. So I get why the parents are doing it. But having gone through it myself, I don't think I would allow my child to do it at five. I would feel more comfortable if he or she waited. And, um, and you know, I'm not the best reference for that because, again, I was an adult when I decided to move forward with um, the therapy and decide mm-hmm. to, um, you know, live in yeah. my truth. 
Right. Let me ask you, um, we, we talked a little bit about discrimination and you also talked, uh, you mentioned that, that preacher who sent you to the doctor who was a Southern Baptist minister, mm-hmm. basically himself too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, was that the same, uh, type of, uh, was that the same individual who didn't want to treat you? Cause you've, you've experienced medical discrimination. Mm-hmm. That, uh, was that that same individual or was yes, that somebody different? That was the exact same individual and um, mm. who had treated me before the transition, but um, told me uh, he declined um, to um, provide medical treatment for me after transitioning. Yes. Same individual. What do you tell, tell us about your ordeal to get uh, medical treatment? What, what you, the inordinate distance that you have to travel and all that kind of stuff? Well, for me, I could not get it locally. So I had to, and I continue to travel um, five hours away uh, to get it. And and that may sound strange to people because I don't actually live in what would be considered a one horse town. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, no. I live in a major city. And um, I'm not going to mention. Two or three hundred thousand, two two hundred thousand people, I would imagine. uh, more, More. And I'm, really? I'm not going to go, you know, into where I live, but yeah, more than 200,000 people easily. And like I said, it's a major city, but there was no one that would um, treat me. And uh, they were open about the reasons why. But in this day and age, you know, I'm a part of a group one of the only groups who it's legal to discriminate against. And, you know, there's mm. really nothing uh, people or that I can do about it. I, I just had to mm. adjust and I had to drive to find, I, I still don't have a primary care physician. I'm seeing a specialist mm. right now. And then there are certain things that she won't do because she's like, well, you have to get that done at your primary care. And I'm saying, well, I don't have one. So in order for me to get like lab work and stuff done to send it to her, I have to go to an independent or freestanding laboratory to have tests done and and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think in the interest of being uh, not playing devil's advocate, but to, to, to look at both sides of that too, mm -hmm. could it be that that physician, um, like you say, I think you would have, it seems like you would have some very unique, um, circumstances and needs. Mm -hmm. And yes. Um, even when it comes to stuff like lab works, I mean, it would be something that would be mm-hmm. um, novel in some ways. And mm-hmm. uh, he might not he might, in fact, not have the ability or the experience or the, the understanding of how to deal with you. Do you, th- do you think that's a possibility? Oh, I took that into consideration because I don't I don't ever want to be the type of person who uh, feels like the entire world is against me and, and mm-hmm. that uh, somebody owes me something. I, I don't ever want to come mm-hmm. across as as that type of person i took that into consideration but also i took into consideration that well hell he can treat me for a cold you know what i'm saying oh yeah or he can can treat me for things that are common to just people um right as far as um things that i need as far as specialty i have a specialist for that Mm -hmm. and that's what i was trying to get over to him and to convey to you um as far as my plight goes i have a specialist. I just needed a primary care physician. Um, right, it's right. just like, you know, when um, biological or cisgender women go to a gynecologist, they still have a primary care physician. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I comfortable see. seeing my specialist because she knows and because she treats a lot of transgender people. You know, she doesn't discriminate against that. She is um, an endocrinologist. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I do need her to check hormone right. levels, but there are simple things that I can have done that would be very convenient for me if I could um, have a primary care physician. So, gotcha. Yeah. Let me. So, so um, with that uh, possible or apparent discrimination from the from the from the doctor, and then looking back at some of the. Um, uh, basically the assault that you went through mm-hmm. and some of the other things that were essentially unsafe. Mm-hmm. And, you, know, you had every right to feel unsafe. What do you think is the proper role of government in helping trans individuals deal with this kind of stuff? Uh, well, let me tell you, let's start with local, local government, because I've also gone through uh, being falsely accused of uh, sexual assault 
on my job and um, local government allowed, I fought that case and I won, uh, Mm -hmm. of course, but it was not before I had to go through the humiliation of um, being sent home from work because what happened was um, an individual and her husband uh, falsely accused Mm -hmm. me of this. And I knew these people. Robert, you mm. know, through work yeah, yeah. because they would come mm-hmm. to my job. I was a laboratory assistant and a phlebotomist and they would come to my job to have blood work done. And she would, she, um, would need me to draw the blood because I'm very proficient in doing it. And she is what mm-hmm. we in the phlebotomy community or the lab community call a difficult stick. So it's not oh, easy yeah. to access veins. So, yeah, I was, um, over, I had gotten to the point where I was over processing. So I would process all of the um, blood work and the samples that would come through the lab. However, when people would encounter difficult sticks, I would also be called to go and draw them. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was the case. And, you know, it started out just like our normal encounter used to be and had been for years. The next thing I knew, you know, I'm saying bye to these people. We're laughing, talking. I'm going back to work on a Friday. Then on Monday, I get a call uh, from the woman saying that her husband was upset with me. And I'm like, why? And she was like, you know, he feels like you disrespected him. I was like, what are you talking about? And I was just so confused about that. So I asked Mm -hmm. her to elaborate and she never really did. And um, he called my job saying something about his being a preacher and how I put two and two together later on. He found out I was transgender. Oh, I see. So um, she called me again on my cell phone and she was like, you know, no big deal. We'll just, you know, everything's fine. I still love you. It's just that he was upset. I was like, okay, how upset is he? Because when I called the number back in my phone, he answered, And he was very cordial. And he told me, because I asked who had called my phone. And he said his wife called. And I was like, what? Anyway, fast forward. That was on a um, Friday that this happened. Or Friday when I encountered them in their room. Monday when she called me. Wednesday, I got a call. Uh, I was pulled out of the lab to go to a meeting and I was told by human resources that a complaint had been filed against me because I had touched her husband on his penis and his behind. And I was sitting there like, what? And she said, yeah, they're saying that you uh, inappropriately, inappropriately touched her husband. And I was like, okay, first of all, I'm in a room in the emergency room with another patient, this woman who was also, she was a patient and her husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there is no way that you all actually believe that I would have done that period, first of all, but especially under those circumstances. Anyway, long story short, that was on a Wednesday. I was called out. I was sent home by human resources. The gentleman from Human Resources called me the same evening and said, you can come back to work uh, tomorrow morning. I said, okay, Mm -hmm. like, just like that, you know, what's going on? He was like, fine, just come back to work. And I said, um, and he said, but before you report to your station, before you clock in, just come to the conference room because we just need you to sign these papers saying that, you know, we spoke to you about this. This is not an admission of guilt or anything like that. It's just saying that we had this conference, whatever I said, fine. So went back to work, Rob, um, Mm -hmm. that Thursday. Um, apparently they found out I was still working there. And so the next week, a detective came to my job. And so the detective interviewed me and told me that the people had gone to the police station and filed a report against me. For what? 
apparently for, assault, like, for uh, apparently for sexual battery. Uh, and I told the, the t- I said, you've got to be joking, right? He said, no. And I was like, okay, this has got to be just a nightmare. I'm going to wake up. And long story short, um, I had to fight this, but the, the detective finally called me, but that was in October. The day mm-hmm. before the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, it was all, it was, and I remember it specifically because it was my last day at work before the Thanksgiving holiday. So I know it was the Wednesday. The detective, um, I actually called him to say, hey, what's going on? You know, you said you were going to stay in touch with me with this. And he said, we're going to charge you with sexual assault. There will be a sexual battery. I'm sorry. There's a warrant for your arrest. If you don't turn yourself in, we're going to come to your job and arrest you. And I said, you're joking. And he said, no. I said, okay, I'm about to call my lawyer. And he says, no, you don't need to call a lawyer. Right now you need to call a uh, bail bondsman. And I said, okay, this is real life right now, you know? So Mm -hmm. I contacted the uh, bondsman. I talked about it and the bondsman didn't even believe it. And I talked to a couple of attorneys of attorneys. They were like, no bullshit. They were like, basically, apparently it sounds like these people wanted you involved in some sexual stuff. And the man found out, um, or he was attracted to you and found out about it, you being transgender and he wasn't happy. So to prove, you know, that he wasn't down with this type of thing, they're just going all out. You know what I mean? Mm. So I turned myself in, I went through the fingerprinting process and all of that bonded right out. You know, I never had to put on the uniform or anything. They just detained me Mm. for, uh, several hours. And uh, I went home that same day, you know, after bonding out and doing all that. But the bottom line is I, my attorney was, you know, taking me through this step. I said, he was never worried. He was like, don't worry. I was like, why are you so calm? He was like, because this is bullshit. And he said, and you're going to be fine because we're going to fight. So I felt like he knew something. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it turns out. He, Sound like he did know something. Yeah. And what he knew was. Um, that they were never going to charge me with that anyway because the assistant DA interviewed these people and she was a young black lady and she came back and told my attorney off the record. She was like, I don't believe a word these people are saying. Apparently, there are some con artists. You know, she was like, they're just weird people. So I don't know if they were just using me to try to sue the hospital, you know what I'm saying, or or mm-hmm. how, you know, what they were thinking. But keep in mind, where these people allege this happened, they continue to come to the same hospital to have the wife's blood work done. And mm-hmm. when they were asked why they, they did not report it when it happened, well, oh, my wife was sick and I was trying to concentrate. On, well, that's bullshit, Robert, because you know it's mm-hmm. something like that. Just like with my assault, the attempted assault in college, I immediately went to the dorm director and told him right. about it the same night that it happened. You don't, and, and I'm not saying, because I know that some people um, don't talk about it, but there are so mm-hmm. many holes in their story. Not to mention, I recorded a phone call when they um, called my cell phone. So I was able to give that to my attorney, and that helped me mm-hmm. also. Mm-hmm. So long story short, I felt like he knew something, and he told me off the record, Sims is going to tell you. He said, the way it works here is they're charging you with simple battery. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that because they can't stick to the lie that you sexually battered this man because Mm -hmm. we know it didn't happen. But because you put your hand on his shoulder, do you know, I was standing right by the man. So it was casual conversation. We were, the three of us were laughing and talking, whatever. And you know how sometimes you lean in and you touch someone on the shoulder like that? Well, mm-hmm. I'm like five, six and a half, five, seven. This man is like six foot plus. So his shoulder is right at like the top of my head or whatever. So we're mm-hmm. laughing and leaning in and I put my hand on his shoulder. So the DA tells me, well, you have to be charged with something because mm-hmm. you touched him contacted him and yeah. here in that state it's considered unwanted touch 
So mm. in order to get money from me, they had to charge me with something. And so what they charged me with was simple battery. The mm. point I'm trying to make to you is all of this going on never would have happened to a biological or natural born woman. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or, or mm. what we call a cisgender woman. That wouldn't mm. have even been pursued. But another thing that pissed me off was I had always been under the impression that it was illegal to file a false report with the police. Right, right. Well, these people, it was proven that they were lying, but nothing happened to them, Robert. And my attorney told me because I said, well, I want to sue them. Let's sue them. And he said, well, I'm going to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Even if you do that, nothing's going to happen to them. He said, the only thing that's going to happen is it's going to cost you a hell of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And you're, they're going to continue to drag this out. And what I want for you mm -hmm. is to put this behind you and to get on with your life. Cause you seem like a very nice person. He said, you seem like a very nice young lady. I just don't want you to have to go through this because they're not going to do anything to them. And he was right, Robert. Mm -hmm. And it cost me no attorney, you know, every attorney that I wanted to take the case, they believed me, but none of them would take it for under like $10,000. Or fifteen thousand mm, dollars. Wow. Fifteen was the, the original price. So I finally found my attorney who took it for less than that, and it cost me mm. money to fight these bogus charges. And he just he flat out told me nothing's going to happen to them. So don't waste your mm. time suing them. Just try to get mm. on with your life. That mm. was a hard pill to swallow because I felt yeah. like it was. Well, you were wronged. I was wronged, and I it it just took me back to that place of discrimination all over again, mm -hmm. because it wouldn't have mm -hmm. happened to any other woman, I think. Mm. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, but kind of remaining in the same track or same vein uh, about mm -hmm. discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the big thing that seems to be uh, going around, I say going around, uh, that, that I notice in the media today is you have essentially male athletes. Mm hmm who claim to be trans suddenly seems like it from what I can tell, it, it always seems like it's a sudden thing. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, they're usually like low end middle of the pack male athletes, but then they claim to be trans. They come out as trans mm -hmm. and then they enter women's sports mm -hmm. and of course dominate mm -hmm. and win women's sports, everything from wrestling to track, mm -hmm. um, basketball, uh, even, um, uh, what do you call that stuff? Mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's your what's your feelings on that? And before you even get into that, I want to ask a kind of related a related question. You're taking the you've taken all the hormones and stuff. Have you noticed any decrease in your physical strength levels? Has there been a oh absolutely a change? Yes, um, definitely a decrease in my upper body strength. Um, um, and the thing about the hormone regimen that I am on is that um, my hormones were the levels are such that um, when blood work was done at one point I had a zero percent testosterone level wow. yeah zero percent so it got to the point where um, my doctor that specialist that I told you about uh, five mm -hmm. six hours away told me she was like well we're going to change your uh, you're level. supposed to have some testosterone, yeah. even if you're a woman. Yes. Women should have uh, some uh, levels of testosterone. And because I had none, you know, we had to decrease um, the uh, the dosages and um, that mm -hmm. type of thing, the strength of the, the hormones that mm -hmm. I was taking. So um, what I would say about um, the competition in sports is that I understand why non-transgender people would have concerns and reservations. Um, because from the outside looking in, I mean, you would just naturally think that they would be stronger, but it depends mm -hmm. on the individual and um, their ho hormone levels. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, you've seen me, your viewers haven't, but... There are, oh, you're a slight person. You're very, very small stature. And that worked for me. Mm -hmm. That was a um, an integral 
integral part of my transition. And Mm -hmm. I feel that, um, it worked to my advantage. I feel very fortunate. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, um, take that for granted. I'm not, you know, I'm fully aware Mm -hmm. of how I just for the people listening. You kind of you you the reason that was a uh, it worked in your favor is because it gave you what you were referring to as the the privilege of of being able to pass absolutely yeah and there is a privilege that comes along with that and I don't deny it you know um, I I enjoy the luxury of uh, when I'm out in public doing very mundane things like shopping or being seated at a restaurant with people saying uh, ma'am to me without giving it a second thought, Mm -hmm. you know, that would be a lot more difficult. Um, and I'm just being honest with you. It would be a lot more difficult if I was what is considered, uh, non-passable or someone who, um, had a little bit more difficulty Mm -hmm. passing. And I, I, Mm -hmm. I fully admit that I enjoy the privilege of that and I don't take it for granted, but I know it's not the reality for a lot of people. And that is mm-hmm. also the case with some of the athletes. And I think um we're a very superficial society. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I believe that <clears throat> because a lot of the transgender athletes look the way that they do, it's off putting for a lot of mm-hmm. people. Because it's a noticeably transgender person standing next to a biological or a cisgender woman. You, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Is so it, I think the, maybe the, the feeling there is that if they're noticeably transgender, mm-hmm. if they're not, if they're not passable or able to pass, does that imply then that the, um, the hormone levels actually haven't changed? In people's minds, it does. Do you, do you understand? Transitioning yeah. is different for different people. Uh, Mm -hmm. The hormones, the results of hormone treatment, um, Mm -hmm. they're they're different for different people. And then that also Mm -hmm. goes back to what we were talking about with the the children starting so young. You know, if Mm -hmm. their thinking is if they catch this before the changes happen um, Mm -hmm. with puberty, then it's easier for the children to transition and to be a little bit more passable. You know, I still, mine is an unpopular opinion. I feel like, you know, it it might be a good idea to wait a little bit longer just to see. But Mm -hmm. um, now I was an adult when I started and it still Mm -hmm. worked out for me, but everybody's different. So I just feel like because we are a very visual society and I I dare say superficial, when we see someone who does not represent what we think womanhood or femininity should be, Standing next to someone who we think does represent mm-hmm. that, it is mm-hmm. off-putting, and it does cause us to be a little bit more biased. I guarantee mm-hmm. you, if the and I hate to sound this way, but I'm just speaking on what I feel people are thinking. You know, mm-hmm. I feel like if the athletes were these attractive, passable people like a Janet Mock or, a, or by all intents and purposes, me, you see my picture, mm-hmm. standing next to mm-hmm. these um, women, then I think mm-hmm. it would not be such an issue or so much of an mm-hmm. issue because it wouldn't be right there in people's right. faces and they wouldn't right. be forced right. to think about it. And yeah. to, and it, I think my take on that mm-hmm. is, uh, you know, earlier how you were talking about um, there's people who are not actually trans mm-hmm. and just because they like to dress a certain way mm-hmm. or act a certain way that, that doesn't make them trans. Yeah. That's the way that's the sneaking suspicion I have about uh, many, some or, or some percentage of these athletes who cross over. For one thing, you never notice or you never see any. I won't say never, but you hardly ever see any female athletes crossing over to be men and compete because they would get crushed. Yeah. There would be no competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. However, you always see a person who doesn't look very passable as a female claiming suddenly to be a female mm-hmm. and then crossing over into a sport and then dominating. Yeah. And I think that's where people begin to think that there may be some kind of, you know, foul play to, to uh, 
not exactly foul play, but some kind of foul intent or some kind of mal intent. It's it's well people who may not really be trans, but they know they can win by doing it. Well, uh, sports is big business, yeah. and uh, when you have different com- countries um, that want to compete and really really want to win, some of them mm. will, you know, do. Yeah, what they feel yeah. uh, they have to do to do that, you know, right. uh, cheating, right. so to speak. Um, I've seen. Yeah, and I was going to say, I'm not even talking about on the country level, like Olympics. I'm talking about, about like just high individual. school and college level. Yeah. Well, high school and college level. Well, that's big uh, business athletes. as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's, it, it that's, is. Yeah. that's big money. I've seen one. I know of one. I, the, the name of the school escapes me. One uh, trans man uh, who wanted to wrestle on the wrestling team. So trans man being a, uh, someone who was biologically female, uh, and mm-hmm. decided to transition into male. I've seen that mm-hmm. with wrestling and, mm-hmm. uh, there was an uproar with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but have you seen the effects of the testosterone and some of the trans men? Some of them look really, really good. And they're really, really handsome yeah. and really, really muscular. Yeah. Because testosterone yeah, is that. far more powerful than estrogen yeah. uh, in terms yeah. of um, transitioning. Um, mm-hmm. I was watching the uh, the Joe Rogan podcast. I don't know if you uh, check out Joe Rogan or know about him. He's got a hugely popular podcast, probably one of the biggest out there. Mm-hmm. And um, he's uh, also a former mixed martial artist. Mm-hmm. So he's a he's a fighter. Yeah. So he he knows very the intimate details of that. And he, one thing that he was saying that made a lot of sense to me, he was saying that even though um, a person may take hormones or uh, be at various different stages of actually being a trans person, a trans athlete, if you're a male and you start taking estrogen as an adult, you still have lived 15, 20, 25 years as a male mm-hmm. and had all the... Uh, physical advantages that testosterone confers coursing through your body, the increased strength, the increased muscle mass, increased bone density, yeah, um, and all that stuff. So even if you do, let's say you really are trans, and even if you do start taking estrogen at 22 years old or 25 or something like that, you still have, it would seem to me, a decided advantage mm-hmm. to a lot of people. a female. You know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. even though, yeah, you started yesterday, but... You've been a man for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get it. And I and I and I totally get why some people would be concerned or they mm-hmm. would uh protest why they should. But it it I think I I think it was you um that we were discussing earlier. Um things are a little different for me because I live in a world where I know that there is a difference between myself and a cisgender or a biological woman. You know, mm-hmm. I um, have no doubt that I am a woman, but I know that there's a difference between me and mm-hmm. um, other women. And because I think I deal in that reality, I'm not mm-hmm. quite as offended by some of the things that I see other transgender women, women uh, protesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, does. So, you know, there there there's something I'm just not so up in arms about. I I, I probably won't be picking up the fight for, you know, um, transgender women to be able to compete in sports or anything. And and, and I know that's going to be a very unpopular opinion. Your your viewers are probably not going to like me very much. For saying that, you know, uh, the people who are trans and are listening, I apologize mm-hmm. uh, because I'm not trying to offend I don't anyone. Apologize. But I, yeah. you know, I feel the way I feel, and I just feel mm-hmm. that that's not as important of an issue to me as it is for me to just be treated like a human being. Um, right. I think the reason there's so much contention right now between trans people and non-trans people is because people feel like we want a little too much. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I kind of understand why they feel that way. I also kind of understand why people get confused on certain things. I'm more mm-hmm. concerned with being treated like a human being and uh, 
being um, having the right to health care and I have to worry about me being fired from my job strictly because I have a boss who has a problem with transgender people or the fact that I'm trans and who's Mm -hmm. less concerned about my, you know, my master's degree and the 30 credits that I've earned toward my doctorate and my Mm -hmm. uh, work performance, you know, in the perfect world, Mm -hmm. that would be all I would have to think about, but it's Mm -hmm. not, you know, I have to deal with the fact that at any time, because I live in an at will state and that a lot of states are, I can be fired simply if they find out I'm trans and they have a problem with that, you know, they don't have to give me a reason other than that. So those issues are bigger to me. Now I understand um, also why people are fighting for that right, because it just kind of falls in line in their opinion Mm -hmm. with basic rights as, you know, right as people or as trans people, you know, and a a part of that means being able to compete in sports as Mm -hmm. the gender uh, with which you identify or use the restroom Mm -hmm. that correlates with the gender as which you identify. I get it. And again, Mm -hmm. I don't mean to sound dismissive, but that's just for me, not one of my major concerns, whether or not a transgender woman can run around the track or, or, you know, yeah. Step in the ring yeah. with a woman. Roll around the wrestling. Yeah, right? oh my guy, I really, yeah. I couldn't care less, really. Yeah. So you were talking about the the things that you feel are worth fighting for, or not worth fighting mm-hmm. for. Uh, I I seem to recall you mentioning that you were going to uh, travel to be on a some sort of civil rights panel or something like that. What are the uh, the official organizations or avenues that you uh, fight through, if any? Um. And and before I say that, let me say again, I wasn't trying to be dismissive because everybody's feelings uh, in some regard to me are valid if they feel that way. Mm -hmm. I was just saying that I'm fighting for other things, especially as a as a black trans woman. You know, I'm I'm just I get it. Yeah. Fighting for the right to not be killed when I walk down. the street. You can't you can't you can't die on every hill. Exactly. Exactly. Now to pick the ones you fight on. Yeah. Now, as far as civil rights. Um, I traveled to be a part of, uh, there was an organization, the Black Transgender Alliance. I actually performed um, at that um, at that particular mm-hmm. rally, that uh, conference is actually what mm-hmm. it was. And it was, it was a good experience because what happened was there was the representation of successful Black trans men and women who are accomplished and who are doing those things that you and I were talking about, um, the way that I would like for black transgender people, black transgender women specifically to be seen just as people Mm -hmm. doing everyday things. So, um, I had the opportunity to perform some of my music there. Also, um, not any major civil rights organizations that you would have heard of, but, locally doing things uh, with my pastor, like trying to start an actual ministry where people feel comfortable worshiping Mm. and not feeling judged um, by who they are and just feeling welcomed, you know, in an atmosphere where these people just want to praise the Lord. And, Mm. you know, it's unfortunate, unfortunate that because they're trans, they don't feel like they're comfortable in certain spaces because they've been told that they're not right. And I don't think Mm -hmm. that we as individuals have the right to say uh, who can or who cannot worship or praise Mm -hmm. if that's what you want to do. You know, some people can live with it or without it. Some people don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. But for those who want Mm -hmm. it, I don't think we should stop people from doing that simply because mm-hmm. they don't look the way we think they should look or they don't represent what we think a man is or what a woman is. And right. uh, so so I'll be involved in um, doing that type of thing uh, with mm-hmm. my pastor. And hopefully that will lead to um, my goal of trying to start a community health program mm-hmm. for transgender people who have been refused health care. I want to start with transgender people, and then I wanted to um, kind of 
blossom into just all people who can't really afford right. adequate health care. But I would definitely definitely like to start with um, trans people because that, as I stated to you earlier, is a group who still um, has the, I think, the... Um, I don't know. We, we're the, like the only group not will the struggle, but the um, the what am I trying to say? You kind of like lack the the only group that it's legal to not extend common. There you go. Um, yeah, we, services. Ex- to. That that's exactly right. You know, um, so that is um, something that I want to concentrate on, and that in itself is going to take allies. Um, I'm going to need allies because just as a Mm -hmm. black transgender woman, I'm not going to be able to do it by myself. I'm going Mm -hmm. to need um, doctors, nurses, uh, medical professionals who are willing to say, hey, I took this oath to heal and to do no harm and to give people adequate care, you know, based on their need Mm -hmm. and not their identity. So, that's, mm-hmm. Those are the things that I'm working on and trying to be a part of right now. Right. What uh, what kind of music do you make? My music, I don't think there's a particular genre. Do you um, sing or you Yeah, play? I, I write, uh, write and sing. And so I wow. uh, have recorded um, music and I'm working on new music right now. And so mine is, um, I think if you just had to, Classified, it's a mixture of R and B, pop, and um, just kind of a, a smooth, easy listening type music. Mm-hmm. If, That's what I pictured from you. Yeah, <laughs> I think if you would, um, I've been compared to different people, like and and not I wouldn't say in forms of talent, of course not, because these people are right. you know who they are. But yeah. I think it's it's far as style and uh style, type of yeah. music um one song i think garnered um comparison to diana ross as far as the style mm. and tempo and there's uh, mm. been others that have uh, with this latest that i'm working on now that has not been released my producer tells me that he gets an india re type feel mm. from it so mm. um i range the gamut between r&b um pop kind of a mm-hmm. uh, new age jazz, but also um, I have recorded an electronic dance um, song that I think is going to do well in mm. Europe and the UK. I, I noticed that in um, Belgium, um, someone is listening to it over there because I was uh, looking at my <laughs> stats and it's been, yeah, uh, yeah so, yeah. That's weird how stuff works online. I, I've seen some of my stuff that I got up and like people in, uh, like I said, Europe, uh, some parts of like Asia uh-huh. and leaving comments on my stuff like they listen to that. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But you have to remember. I, I put that up. Yeah. There's life outside of the United States. And I think that uh, fortunately for an artist like myself, who is not going to mm-hmm. fit into the, uh, a lot of what's being lauded and um, celebrated here on the radio in the United States at this point. You know, I'm definitely Mm -hmm. not a um, drop it like it's hot type artist with the... uh, That's not even your personality. Yeah, with the bump. But at the same time, I don't knock it because I believe everybody's art form is their art form and the way they interpret, you know, music, I think it's, uh, it's it's interesting to see other people's interpretation of their art form. So I don't ever knock anybody mm-hmm. else's art form, but at the same time, I still want to just be true to myself and do what's comfortable to me. Right. Mm-hmm. That's good. I mean, that's all you can do as an artist though. I mean, yeah. that's, the the more you do that as an artist, the more successful you are, regardless yeah. of how much you sell or make right. anything like yeah. that. Where, where can people hear your stuff at? Um, people can go to, um, all of the, the streaming outlets, uh, pretty much, um, Spotify, I'm on, Mm -hmm. um, YouTube music. I think I have not shot any official videos yet, but I have three, um, songs out there. Um, Spotify, iTunes, Apple music. I think Google music Mm -hmm. has me and title or something like that. 
What, where, what can they find you under? What's the, the artist's name? What's your name? Uh, well, I'm under Sunshine Jackson. So Now, Sunshine is a family name. And so I did that so I can just kind of keep my private life private oh, yeah. and, you know, do yeah, yeah. that. Yeah. So, yeah, Sunshine Jackson is what they can find that under. And uh, okay. if they look on those... Um, I mean, through those avenues, um, like I said, Spotify, okay. iTunes, Apple Music, YouTube. All right, cool. I'll put that down in the uh, the, the write up for this podcast and stuff. Uh, it'll be down there so people can click on the links and go to that to those uh, those various sites. Yes, please. And uh, do you mind if I if I happen to download something? Do you mind if I play a little something on the outro? I don't mind at all. I don't mind at all. All right, cool. So I'll, I'll do that and. Um, as we kind of kind of close out here, mm-hmm. are there anything, uh, any other thoughts you might have on anything that we've talked about, or is there anything that we left out, or any kind of um, advice you want to give? Or? Yeah, there are a couple of things I would like to leave uh, with you and your viewers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, transgender people, we're real people. You know, I, it's unfortunate, um, as we talked about earlier, that the media representation is more of caricatures and negative stereotypes and um, sexual fetishes and that type of thing. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and say that um, every transgender person that you come in contact with is going to be the same as me. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we're all different. We run the gamut and it takes all kinds. I don't have a problem with that because if you think about all groups, there are negative stereotypes in all groups. And mm-hmm. what saddens me is um, is the typical thing with um, in black society, the um, negative stereotypes, unfortunately, get more of the publicity or uh, the showcase, you know, and mm-hmm. it leaves people in our cases, it leaves people who have never met a transgender person to believe that that what they see on TV or in the media, the negative stereotypes, the caricatures, the, um, the um, ill representations, it leads them to believe that that's what it is. And if I can mm. just be a small part of making them realize that that's not the totality of what that is, that that's actually the exception and not the norm, then I mm-hmm. feel like, um, I think that I would would have done a small part in um, playing a positive role and hopefully cause someone to want to have a dialogue and get to know not just me, but get to know a little bit more about what transgender truly is as opposed to what it's portrayed to be um, in the media. Mm-hmm. So, Well, I think that's a, that's actually something that needs to be done. And I, I think it's safe to say, uh, we both have uh, similar feelings about the media. It seems mm-hmm. like um, people, I mean, you just, you can't forget that they're after ratings and yeah. uh, po- power, you know what I'm saying? Sensationalism works. Like sensationalism yeah. works. Yeah. 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 It, it does. Well, I tell you what, I think this was a sensational conversation yeah. and I'm glad that we got a chance to, to chat. Well, I want to thank you for um, having the courage and the wherewithal to even want to um, sit down and know more. You know, you and I are friends from way back, but the fact that you would give me the opportunity to come on to discuss a subject that I think is very needed and to get an opportunity to shine a different light on a subject that seems to be so taboo um, that people mm-hmm. don't even want to talk about, I think um, is great. And I'm very, very appreciative to you. So, um, and if I have to give up a little pleasure, yeah, if I have to give a little bit up of my extreme privacy to play, like I said, Mm -hmm. a small part in making a a positive impact. And I'm, I'm happy that you allowed me to do that. So thank you. Uh Well, yeah, once again, thanks for coming on. And uh, like I said, uh, when it's regard to privacy, uh, me and all my six listeners, I think I'll, I think you'll be all right for some time. Yeah, you know yeah, for a little while, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so I think you, I think you're still good. Okay, okay. All right, well, hey, I'm going to go ahead and let you go. I'll talk to you later. And, uh, thanks, uh, thanks again. Thank you so much, Robert.